The Mets 1973 come from behind miracle finish still fresh in the minds of New Yorkers. Everyone believed more in 74. The home opener was eagerly anticipated with the expectation that the Mets might make it two pennants in a row. As the National League championship flag was raised at Shea Stadium, new season hopes were soaring with manager Yogi Berra presenting a solid day in day out lineup for the first time in the Mets 13 year history. Catcher Jerry Grody was coming off a sensational stretch performance in 73. First baseman John Milner was looking to increase his team leading home run total. Second baseman Felix Mian was hoping to continue his super steady fielding and hitting in his second season with the Mets. Shortstop Bud Harrelson was healthy once again to provide the glue for the inner defense. Third baseman Wayne Garrett was coming off his finest major league season. Left fielder Cleon Jones had been Mr. Clutch with 14 runs batted in for the final 10 games en route to the Eastern Division title. Don Hahn provided consistent fielding in center field. And in right field, Rusty Staub was hoping to pick up where he left off following his World Series heroics. This set lineup card certainly pleased Yogi Berra, but the pride and joy of any manager is his mound core. We have a good pitching staff. Uh, I know everybody wants him. Uh, we could trade either Seavers, Matt Lack, or Kuzman. But then you go around and ask everyone, you know, what they're looking for, pitching. So sometimes, you know, you, get, you could get hitting, but if you, get, uh, if you don't have pitching, the hitting's not going to help you. And the Mets surely did have pitching strength. Jerry Kuzman's 1973 comeback was one of the big lifts that helped bring the pennant to New York. Tom Seaver was 1973 Cy Young winner, his second such award, and in his pitching prime at age 29. John Matlack, a hard luck hurler last year, was looking to regain the form that brought him Rookie of the Year honors two seasons ago. Harry Parker, Greg Swan, and George Stone would help round out the starting rotation. And when relief help was needed, Tug McGraw would get the call. McGraw's powerful finish in 73 not only made you believe, it also erased the memory of early bullpen failures. After they shot out the first man on opening day in Philadelphia's Veterans Stadium, the fun disappeared for the New York Mets. Tug McGraw was trying to protect a one-run lead in the bottom of the ninth against the Bills when Mike Schmidt's two-run blast turned the game around. Losing pitcher, Tug McGraw. Winning pitcher, Max Scarce. And an early indication of things to come. Suddenly, the Mets' injury jinx of previous seasons went into its instant replay routine. For some inexplicable reason, every year seems to bring a lengthy list of weird accidents and a variety of medical ailments to the Mets. Key starters were struck down and missed sizable portions of the schedule, including Mian, Jones, Harrelson, and Grody. The pitching staff wasn't immune either. Doug McGraw was saddled with a sore shoulder, and Tom Seaver was severely hampered by a lingering sciatic nerve condition. The injuries triggered all kinds of letdowns and problems for manager Yogi Berra. 
Well, I think the most disappointing uh, was is our pitching. Uh, if you told me Tom Seaver was only going to have 11 wins for the year, I have to say you're crazy. I thought when we left Florida, we were going to have the best pitching staff we ever had. But I guess the injuries plagued us again uh, this year. I've been here three years, and uh, in three years, we've always had injuries. But 1974's problems were constant. George Stone, with the National League's best winning percentage a year ago, was sidelined most of the season. Jerry Grody missed just about half of the year, and Rusty Staub, a tough man to keep out of the lineup, was bothered by old injury problems that never quite healed. This would prove to be one season when there would be no miracle to overcome adversity. Because it, it seems to happen to our key players all the time, and that's pretty uh, tough, like Bud Harrelson, uh, Jerry Grody, uh, Cleon Jones, Rusty Stiles uh, was out. You don't mind losing for a couple of days, but we lose them for a month at a time. And in truth, it must be told that the injuries were only a part of the Mets' troubles in 1974. An inability to score the decisive run in close contests, plus the bullpen collapse, left the Mets with a frustrating 17 wins and 36 losses in one-run games. The uncanny ability to win the tight ones was the Mets' secret to success in 1969 and 1973. This season, that magic formula vanished. A reversal of that 17 and 36 mark would have spelled the difference between the Mets' eventual fifth place finish and another Eastern Division title. But baseball is noted for being a game of one-run decisions, and inches can spell the difference. In 1974, those so close yet so far inches favored the opposition time and time again. were not frequent recipients of Letty Luck's favors, the loyal New York fans continued their unwavering support. Special event days were a particular interest to the big crowds, like Helmet Day, Batting Glove Day, Fan Appreciation Day, Derry Lee Knight, test the ingenuity of the Mets fans, and they always respond with a flurry of creativity. The midwives had their second consecutive successful and attractive softball season. Family Day provides a futuristic look at the stars of the late 1980s. celebrate their 10th anniversary. Roy Campanella is probably being told he could look it up. Casey's never at a loss for words, especially on Old Timers Day at Big Shea. Retired just one year ago, one of your younger old-timers, Willie Mays, has their crowd up and cheering. The standing ovations aren't reserved for just Mets heroes on this glorious day, as fans respond to Hall of Famers Joe DiMaggio and Stan Musial.
spotlight always returns to Casey Stengel. And old Case is up to his usual shenanigans. In the old-timers game itself, Willie Mays gets a base hit. Willie proceeds to delight the crowd by creating a typical Mays chase scene. are no longer as willing as the spirit, and Willie's mighty happy to get caught and accept a helping hand from Maury Wills. Excuse me, Mr. Kiner, but while you're talking about future Hall of Famers like Willie Mays, allow me to congratulate baseball's newest member of the Hall of Fame, none other than Ralph Kiner. On behalf of all of New York's fans and the Mets organization, congratulations, Ralph. Thank you, Lindsay. Returning to something that Mets fans had to cheer about all season, the pitching of John Matlack was simply overwhelming at times and led to John's initial all-star appearance. The all-star game was very funny, uh, ironical almost, I guess, because we went through uh, the pennant race and the playoffs in the series last year, and I really never got nervous or scared at any of it. And in the all-star game, I was so scared and nervous, I could hardly even grip the ball. And I'm really not sure why that was. I guess it was because of the fact that I came into the ball game in the middle of the game. Uh, having only made, I think, two relief appearances in my entire big league career, uh, finding myself in the middle of the ball game uh, with runs already scored and plays already made and things of this nature, I really was uneasy. I really didn't know how to handle the situation and was very nervous. I gave up, I think, a ground ball for an out and, and two fly balls for outs. Had two guys on base. They had a scoring chance off me, but uh, we made the defensive plays and I didn't give up any runs. Although John Matlack led the Mets in complete games, had an impressive 2.41 earned run average and surrendered only eight home runs in 265 innings, John felt it was a disappointing year. Coming off a year uh, like we had last year winning the pennant, uh, especially winning it the way we did down the stretch uh, with some very good baseball in, say, the last six weeks, it's very disappointing to have uh, the same type of season take place almost exactly until you get to the point where we made our move last year and this year we didn't make one uh, we had a lot of problems we had some injuries and uh, we just couldn't seem to play consistent baseball i'm totally convinced that for some reason or another and i don't know what that reason is we didn't put our best foot forward this year and i hope we can do that next year you no know, a lot of people have asked me uh, how can you have statistics like you have and be a 500 pitcher and uh, this is baffling to me i really don't know i feel like uh, i've go out to the mound every five days. I do uh, the best job I'm capable of on that day. And uh, sometimes I come up short, sometimes I win. Uh, it was something when I first came up in the Met organization that uh, Jerry Grody told me uh, in my first start. I came out to the mound before the game started and said, uh, if you don't give them any runs, I'll guarantee you a tie. And this really was to make me relax. And uh, in that situation, I was very nervous. But uh, there was a lot of truth in what he said. The Mets did not have a lot of power. We didn't seem to score a lot of runs. and. Uh, so far this year, that seems to be the only way I can win a ball game. If I give up uh, two, three runs, I'm on the losing end, and uh, consequently to win a game, I almost have to put the shutout. And that's just what John Matlack did with amazing frequency. John paced all National League hurlers with a total of seven shutout performances. Tom Seaver experienced the most frustrating season of his career. That fluid, hard-driving pitching motion was interrupted by a sciatic nerve injury that persisted all season long. Occasionally, we were treated to genuine flashes of the real Tom Seaver. Tom went over the 200 strikeout level for the seventh straight year, the first National League pitcher ever to obtain this feat. The Major League mark is now shared by Rube Waddell, Walter Johnson, and Tom Seaver. With a clean bill of health from the medics, Seaver is once again prepared to resume his position as the number one pitcher in baseball. Jerry Kuzman had an impressive campaign for the second year in a row. Kuzman was the Mets' winningest pitcher and was in a virtual tie with John Matlack for the most innings pitched with 265. Jerry fell just short of Matlack in complete games with a total of 13. But Kuzman was the Mets' most consistent performer during a year when that quality was otherwise missing. Overall, Jerry was the Mets' number one hurler in 1974. A 
bright spot for future Met pitching hopes was the work of Bob Apodaca. The 24-year-old right-hander showed promise during late-season starting assignments after being utilized primarily as a relief man earlier. Apodaca wound up the year as the fifth busiest member of the Mets staff. Jerry Grody was on the National League All-Star squad for the second time in his career. Jerry was off to an excellent start in 1974, but injuries turned the second half of his season around. Grody's presence in the lineup was sorely missed. John Milner led the Mets home run parade for the second consecutive season. The Hammer also led the team in runs scored. Manager Yogi Berra is hopeful. The 1975 will be the year that John Milner puts his power, potential, and a 100% healthy season all together. Cleon Jones had a steady season at the plate with a 282 batting average. Cleon led the team in doubles, but missed almost 40 games with knee troubles. Cleon underwent surgery in the offseason to correct that problem, and he's looking forward to a strong year in 75. Felix Mian had the Mets' longest hitting streak during the season, but again, injury woes made an untimely appearance and kept Felix out of the lineup. When healthy, Felix triggers a double play combination that ranks among the very best in all of baseball. Rusty Staub led the team in game-winning hits. Total hits, runs batted in, and games played. When the Mets offense is making noise, you'll usually find Rusty right in the middle of the rally. Staub and the rest of the revised Mets batting order anticipate additional run production in 1975. In the field, Rusty Staub's strong right arm led to a grand total of 19 assists, the National League leader among all the outfielders. The 1974 season brought about an acute need for versatility and bench strength. Regular third baseman Wayne Garrett filled in admirably for Bud Harrelson at shortstop. Ron Hodges, in his sophomore year with the Mets, had a busy season as the backup to Jerry Grody behind the plate. Young Benny Aiella showed great talent in spring training and then came up to New York for his Major League debut on August 27th after spending the season at Tidewater. Batting for the first time in his Major League career, Aiella belted a home run. Benny became the first Mets player ever to homer in his first at-bat, the first National Leaguer to do so in 13 years, and only the 40th player in Major League history to accomplish that trick. Ed Cranepool, the veteran on the roster, having participated each and every year of the New York Mets existence, had the kind of season that bench men dream of. Coming out of the dugout cold and staying fully prepared at all times for whatever job Yogi Berra requests is not an easy assignment. But Ed Cranepool feels it's a necessity for any team that has hopes of winning. If you looked over the rosters of a lot of major league clubs today, you'll find out that most of the good clubs and the winning clubs have more than nine men to win. Uh, the last couple of years, the Chicago Cubs have been a real good instance of that fact. Uh, they weren't able to win with the eight best men in the National League. You have to have a bench. The Dodgers, for instance, have a real good bench. Myself, I've led the ball club in games, played a lot of years, and I'm still considered an extra man. So you need these men due to the scheduling, the way the ball club travels every day, day in and day out, in 162 games. It's almost impossible for one individual to be prepared and play 100% every day. I believe the extra men have to have pride in themselves and their own ability and also pride in the ball club. And that's the only way you can prepare yourself every day. You have to go out there thinking of being a regular player. Of course, if you're not playing that day, you have to prepare yourself and work a little bit harder. And of course, it is tougher as an extra man. But self-pride is your only motivation. And of course, you don't need a leader. 
You have to have pride in your own ability and pride in yourself and pride in winning, and that makes the most important thing in, in baseball. You have to be prepared and root for yourself. You pull for yourself, you have to pull for your teammates. It takes 25 men to win a pennant. The Mets have done it two out of five years, and that's by playing together as teamwork. Ed Crane Poole hit an unbelievable 486 in pinch hitting rules, 300 overall, and then continued his solid hitting as the New York Mets went on a postseason tour of Japan. A familiar slogan in a most unfamiliar setting. The flavor and tradition of baseball Japanese style won't catch our Mets flustered. Right, Yogi? While Japan's fans got a chance to see Major League stars they've only read about, the Mets were stargazing too, facing Shugeo Nagashima of the Tokyo Giants and his renowned teammate, Satahara Oh. Oh, Japan's all-time home run king, showed the Mets his true form with his grand slammer to give the Giants a come-from-behind victory. Following a slow start, the Mets gathered momentum, however, and ultimately emerged victorious on the tour as John Milner, Ed Cranepool, and company supplied their own home run power. The tour's most valuable player turned out to be one of the new Mets, Joe Torrey. Obtained from the St. Louis Cardinals when the 74 season concluded, Torrey wasted no time in joining his new teammates and adding a scoring punch to the Mets lineup. traded. Uh, it was a real rush, rush job to be able to get my passport and visa and stuff to get ready to go to Japan because I only had about 10 days. But I agreed to go for, uh, first of all, for, first and foremost, to get to know the guys. This way I didn't have to wait till spring training and sort of sit back in the corner and uh, know where I fit in or, or try to talk to certain guys or kid with certain guys about uh, uh, the way they play or, you know, you didn't know who to agitate and who to talk serious to. And in being able to go over there 30 days with them, it, it really is going to make playing with the club and spring training a whole lot different and uh, a lot more relaxed on my part. The trip to Japan marked a transition for the Mets, with Bob Sheffing stepping aside after five years as general manager and passing the reins on to Joe McDonald. Both the new and the old GMs were in total agreement that this was one sight they'd seen enough of. The Mets tried to bring Joe Torrey to New York before, but this year they succeeded. This was barely the first of several transactions. Joe McDonald comments. Well, I felt that we needed to increase our run production and at the same time hopefully add a little speed, speaking offensively uh, as well as defensively because you always utilize speed uh, in every position except catching. And I think... Uh, with uh, the five trades we've made that we have uh, started to accomplish this. On the acquisition of uh, Joe Torrey, we feel we have added a lot of sock to our lineup. Uh, Joe is an accomplished professional, and regardless of what position he plays, I think just to have him in the lineup or on the bench will be an inspiration to our club. Joe Torrey can play third base first or even catch if need be. His versatility and power will be a big plus. Another new bat with impressive hitting statistics is Gene Kleins. Gene Kleins is a very swift outfielder who never really had a chance to break into the Pittsburgh lineup or outfield. Gene had an off year in 1974, and he's a good offensive ball player. By that I mean he can run, and he's potentially a fine leadoff man. Of course, in making our trade with the Phillies, we were reluctant to give up Tug McGraw. He had been such an important factor in us winning the pennant in 1973. In making all trades, you have to give to get. And we feel that in acquiring Del Unza, we get a very established ball player who should help our outfield pitcher immensely. We receive a left-handed pitcher in exchange for Tug, who is five years younger than Tug, and hopefully will uh, will improve under Rube Walker, and um, last but not least, John Stearns is regarded as one of the finest catching prospects in the minors. We have seven new faces, so I, I think we have improved ourselves, and a lot depends upon the health of uh, some of our star players. The new and younger relief man Joe McDonald referred to is Max Scarce. Many observers feel that Scarce has the potential to be one of the most reliable and durable firemen in the National League.
center fielder, Del Unser, obtained in the same trade with the Phillies, gives the Mets a steady and sweet swinging hitter. Unser can hit for average and with power, too. When Dell's game-breaking ability surfaces at Shea Stadium, from now on, it'll be in the Mets' home whites, not the visitors' gray. Unser's fielding is first-rate also, and this season, when he unleashes those long-distance throws to third base, he'll have Joe Torre on the receiving end, and the din of those roaring Mets fans on the cheering end. To me, enthusiasm comes to mind when I think of New York because you think of Shea Stadium right away when you think of the Mets. And uh, I know one thing, when you're catching or playing first or playing third base, there's no way you can hear a catcher yell, uh, cut it off or let it go. You've got to pretty much judge on your, on your own because of the, the complete mayhem that, that goes on at Shea Stadium. I really believe that uh, if any one baseball team had a decided advantage, it, uh, it would be the Mets because those fans really make a difference. New York has always been the Big Apple. It's been called that by many people and it's the place to play. And New York, uh, the New York Mets have been the team and hopefully uh, they'll be the team again. And, and I feel that the Mets have been known as pitching and other people. Well, I hope this year we can change it because I feel with uh, the players we've got, that we can uh, really generate some kind of an offense. And I feel that the rest of the team, aside from the pitchers, not that we haven't got great pitchers, but I feel that the rest of the team can really establish an identity and be the Mets and not the other guys. This could be the year the Mets put their hitting and pitching together. You know they have the experience. They've won pennants with thrilling late season drives twice in the past five years. Now with the addition of new faces like Del Unser, Max Garris, Gene Kleins, Jack Heideman, Bob Gallagher, Orge Roque, and the homecoming of Joe Torre, combining with injury free seasons for the walking wounded. Shea Stadium is the place to be as the New York Mets loyal legion of fans look forward to the happy prospect of pennant pressure down the stretch. In this, the year of the comeback. <laughs>